All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? I know there's folks still probably rolling in as, as there always tends to be, uh, but first I'd like to welcome everyone to Glucose um, Next uh, New Frontiers uh, in uh, Connected Care. I uh, appreciate you guys all joining here for us for our session two uh, on patient engagement. For those of you that missed it, we did have a session one webinar. Uh, it's, it, the recording is actually on our website. You can go watch it. Uh, it was uh, The topic was actually focused on innovation you know, in terms of how do you actually bring in the, the new digital health solutions into your various practices, how do you implement them, and best practices on that end. So if you uh, missed that, uh, or want to just watch the highlights again, definitely go and go check it out. In addition, this webinar is also obviously being recorded, and we will make this available shortly after uh, the conclusion of this webinar as well, likewise on our website. Um, Couple of sort of house rules. Uh, if you guys have questions, uh, anyone is feel, uh, please feel free to uh, type them into the Q and A section of the Zoom webinar, which you should be able to find at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then, uh, sort of at the inappropriate time, then we will certainly pose those questions for the uh, for the panelists and uh, and the discussion to take place. Um, and then, if you have any product related questions. Um, I can uh, share with you some of our uh, support information regarding Gluco. Uh, so if you have any questions, please check out our help center, uh, support.gluco.com. Um, there's a wealth of articles and information there for to help with connecting devices or looking at reports or what have you. There's also obviously an email and a hotline uh, for you to use uh, if there are any questions uh, product related regarding uh, the, the Gluco platform. And of course, if uh, you, we appreciate any feedback on the product as well as uh, this marketing event, so please feel free to uh, provide your feedback through those emails as well too. And with that, uh, I would like to now turn this over to our moderator for this uh, roundtable discussion, which is um, our chief medical officer, Dr. Mark Clements. He is a professor of pediatrics uh, and a practicing clinician. Um, he is also actively involved in the type one diabetes exchange uh, and has conducted several research uh, clinical studies uh, around diabetes and, uh, and other uh, endocrinology related issues. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I really appreciate everybody being here today. I want to um, uh, invite our panelists. So uh, we have uh, the good fortune of having uh, Gary Shiner and Teresa MacArthur with us today. Gary uh, has been uh, a certified diabetes educator since uh, 1995 and has had type 1 diabetes since 1985. He's the owner and clinical director of Integrated Diabetes uh, Services, uh, which is a practice located outside of Philadelphia. And he specializes in intensive insulin therapy and advanced education uh, for both children and adults there. Uh, Gary was named the 2014 Diabetes Educator of the Year by the American Association of Diabetes Educators, now the uh, ADCES. Uh, he has written seven books, including the best-selling Think Like a Pancreas, A Practical Guide to Managing Diabetes with Insulin. And uh, I have uh, known for some time uh, about Gary because he lectures both nationally and internationally for people with diabetes, as well as uh, professionals uh, in our field. Uh, Teresa MacArthur uh, is the uh, Senior Vice President of Clinical Services for Cecilia Health, which is a virtual first care provider uh, organization delivering integrated care to patients across all chronic disease risk profiles. She herself is a registered dietitian, a certified uh, diabetes care and education specialist with a master's degree in clinical nutrition. She has experience working with uh, diabetes, health and wellness, nutrition support, uh, weight and chronic disease management. She has a wealth of experience working with uh, children and adults with both type one and type two diabetes. Uh, so, so both of our speakers are uh, uh, really versatile here. Um, uh, women with gestational diabetes and has served as a diabetes educator in inpatient, outpatient and community settings, um, teaching patients how to understand their diabetes, providing them with the tools they need to manage their diabetes has been her passion for many years. So Gary and Teresa, I'd like to thank both of you uh, for being here today and welcome. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I want to um, open our discussion uh, today with uh, a focus on sort of the um, latest uh, and greatest in um, 
patient engagement. So this is a problem that we all face, particularly in the post-pandemic era, if I can call it that. Uh, where we're delivering a lot more remote care, a lot more digital care. So I would like to begin by asking the two of you what some of the biggest challenges are that you face in helping patients better manage their diabetes and associated uh, chronic issues. And uh, um, maybe Gary, well, we can start with you. Oh, sure. I mean, there's an endless list of challenges that we all have to contend with when it comes to uh, patient diabetes care. But ultimately, it is patient care. I think that's an important uh, concept. Uh, diabetes is not managed by physicians. It's not managed by diabetes care and education specialists. It's managed by patients. So patients really do need to understand the nuances of their disease. They have to understand their treatment options. They need to understand the cause and effect relationships of not just the treatments they receive, but their own behaviors. And you know, one of the big challenges is, is apathy on the part of the patient, as well as their healthcare providers, because many of them don't give diabetes the level of attention that it should. They don't give, give it the seriousness that, that they really should. Um, many patients uh, just don't think their diabetes is that big a deal and don't think they have the resources at their disposal to manage it either. And a lot of that stems from providers that just aren't doing the job. They're really not uh, pointing their patients in the right direction and instilling the attitude <laughs> that's necessary for them to take the bull by the horn, so to speak, and manage it. I think the other major challenge that I see is the payer model. You know, the traditional payer model is fee for service. You come to a provider for an appointment, and that provider gets paid for the services rendered at that appointment. But diabetes is the kind of health condition that doesn't lend itself to that type of care. It lends itself to more of an ongoing coaching, monitoring, management type of a service. And for the most part, the payer system does not have a structure in place for handling that kind of level of care. So I, I think that's, that's a major underlying challenge. So for providers to be able to provide that ongoing coaching service, the ongoing monitoring management service, uh, a lot of times they're doing it at a loss because they don't get reimbursed for a lot of that extra time. Um, so I, I consider those two of the, the biggest challenges. And I guess one we're also gonna dig into today is about getting data. Uh, when we are providing virtual or remote care for patients, uh, you know, accessing data that'll help us make competent decisions and guide the patient properly, it's essential. We need accurate data, we need complete data in order to be able to do that. And it's not always the easiest thing to do. You know, there, we'll talk later, I'm sure, about some of the specific programs we can use to accomplish that, but it, it does remain a challenge. Got it. Uh, Teresa, perspectives that you have on this mm -hmm. question or, or any reactions to things that Gary said? Yeah, I agree 100% with everything that Gary outlined. And I think to add to that, when we connect with individuals, what we find is there's there's kind of usually this wall um, that's up where I'm, I'm just going to be judged or I haven't been doing enough. And you're just going to highlight that. Um, you know, what are you going to do that's going to be valuable for me or encouraging for me? Um, you know, I don't, I don't view anything as personalized that you're going to provide to me. How do you know what I'm going through? Um, how do you understand my journey and where I've come from? Um, cause I think too often there's, there's a lack of that with the provider, that deep conversation. And a lot of it's just time, you know, these visits with their providers are quick and it doesn't open the door for some of that um, very close, trusted conversation that needs to happen. And, and when we start to connect with individuals, you know, it's not right in that first sentence. It takes a little bit of conversation to understand somebody just asking, hey, what's most important to you about your diabetes? Just, just let's just ask that right on the front end. And I think it's interesting because when we do a lot of video um, engagements, you can see on their face, like, can't believe you just asked me that. <laughs> No one's ever asked me that. Usually it's just, hey, okay, your A1C is this, and clearly you're not taking your medication and you know you need to you need to be doing that. And they walk away very discouraged. So I think 
people are hesitant to engage just because of, of those assumptions and thinking that's what's going to happen. So why, why even take part? Um, so I think that personalization is key, letting them know up front that, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to look at what you're going through, your medications, what's your regimen, what's working, what's not, and let's start with what's most important to you. And I think a, a result of that is a more open conversation with their provider because they feel more confident and they can have those conversations. Excellent. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with everything that both of you just said. I suppose that one of the things I'm hearing in your answers is number one, uh, that we are trying to fit what we know is uh, the right thing to do as a, a square peg into a round hole when we try to match, you know, what we know we need to do to the actual incentives uh, in the payer system. The other thing that I hear uh, is that we have really high value on time and that there are many burdens on our time, both before we get to a patient encounter and during a patient encounter. Um, we have burdens on our time that prevent us from understanding evidence-based patient engagement strategies, right? Psychosocial interventions that really work. We have burdens on our time that focus our attention on just how to get the data out of the device, um, how to uh, uh, deal with um, uh, the kind of cognitive switching or burden of moving from platform to platform and, and everything that that entails. And, and so uh, a theme for today might be, uh, you know, how do we give ourselves as providers back the gift of time by engineering uh, the way we prepare for and conduct our visits? So I just want to plant that little seed. Um, I, uh, I really appreciate the insights that both of you shared there. So with that in mind, I want to ask, you know, what, what, what are some of the digital tools, if we think about digital tools as potential extenders of the really empathetic, um, interested clinicians and, and clinical care providers who want to help these patients, what are some of the digital tools that you found helpful to give you back the gift of time so that you can focus on engaging uh, with patients and uh, improving you know, their, their adoption of various strategies that will help them be successful in their own health. And I'll let you, either one of you take it first. Well, I, one of the things I find very useful is, is having uh, contextual data, not just glucose information. The contextual data is what helps us come to the right decisions and guide the patient the right way. You know, the analogy I use, it's, it's kind of like if you're going to watch the movie The Godfather as opposed to seeing a photograph from the movie, a photograph of Vito Corleone playing with his grandson in the garden makes you think it's a very peaceful, happy kind of movie. But you watch the movie, it gives you context and you understand what's really going on. When we look at glucose data, we need more than just what was your blood sugar. We need to know, you know what went into it. And Teresa, like you mentioned, understanding what the, where the patient's coming from, what their situation is, and what's contributing to their glucose management. So having uh, information beyond just glucose values, I find extremely helpful. So things like uh, fitness trackers, activity trackers that track step counts, accelerometers, I find very helpful because then I can see how their physical activity correlates with what the glucose is doing. And so can the patient when we point it out to them. Uh, apps like things like MyFitnessPal, where you can track your, your food intake, you can track emotions and moods, uh, sleep trackers, knowing you know, if somebody's sleeping well or not, or not, if they're interrupted sleep, things like that. And being able to integrate all that together into a program, now you have something really powerful. Right. You have glucose data and you have context about what went into, what caused the glucose values to be what they were. And when you show patients those kinds of cause and effect relationships, that's what sinks in. And like you said, Teresa, you just want to say, you don't want to look at it and say, you're high, your sugars are too high, fix it. 
Now we can show them, okay, here, when you ate this, this is what happened. When you did this activity, this is what happened and so on. And you get buy-in, you can get buy-in from the patients when you can do that sort of thing. Those are great, great points, Gary. And I think you hit on the, the one thing that really resonated with me is you're showing them. So I think too often they think, okay, I'm gonna track all this data, what I eat, what I did, and then you're gonna look at it and you're gonna tell me what I should do with my insulin or whatever. And it's work for them in that sense. You don't want it to be work for them. You want it to be something that, I don't know if I wanna say enjoy, but kind of enjoy doing, but not that it's um, cumbersome or, you know, again, defeating. It needs to be encouraging. And it's okay if you ate this and you went high. Let's talk about it. You know, does, maybe it's not the food. Maybe it's just the amount. Or maybe it's because you're going through a lot right now. And we have a mom that's a single mom and she cares for her kids. And she's like, you know, I got to run high because if I go low, I can't take care of my kids. You got to address that first before you can think she's going to track her food. But I, I love, you know, my, my fitness pal and, and a lot of these um, apps that are out there with exactly what you said, the more data that we have from the day to day and the lifestyle as educators, the more we can support and help someone really truly manage their diabetes. But mm -hmm. if they can't connect those dots and they get excited, I mean, it's interesting. We had a patient and he, and he said, oh, okay, I ate an apple this size. I'm going to try one this size and see what happens, you know, and they, and that's lifestyle, that's behavior change. And they start to connect patterns and trends. So I think, um, you know, getting them to understand the value to them. It's not just me as your educator that I would love to see your food and all your doses and everything that you've taken that will help me. Yes. And that will help your provider, but, um, what's the win for you? You know, what's the value to you? And when you get that, that's, that's the stickiness. That's what really keeps them engaged and, and excited. You're right, though. It is work. Uh, when we ask patients to track these kind of things, uh, we shouldn't do so lightly. We're asking them to do work for yeah. us. So they've got to be something in return for them. Right. I found a helpful approach is to ask them to, I call it binge logging. I, I don't want them to feel like, wow, I got to track this stuff the rest of my life. I tell them, listen, for a week, yeah. let's just binge. Let's track everything. Right? And I don't want you to feel self-conscious about what you do or don't do. Do your normal things. Eat what you want. Let's, and then let's take a look at it. So when you have a, a solid week or two weeks or whatever it is where you have everything in place, there's so much you can learn and glean from that, so many insights you can derive. I couldn't agree more. You know, I, I think that uh, the idea of binge logging, and that's the first time I've heard it described that way, Gary, uh, is recognizing first that there's incredible value to that detailed um, data. Second, that we don't want to overburden individuals with diabetes with too much work. But if we can give them a guidepost, if we can use techniques like motivational interviewing, for instance, uh, which I heard infused in, in Teresa's response, um, to help them see the value of doing this for even a short time, uh, then I think we can um, create a sort of small pot of gold, right? Like I, I, one week of logging, even for a year to me is incredible, incredibly valuable. If we could get people to do it two times or three times a year like that, uh, I think there's uh, a lot of value to that. As a, an endocrinologist myself, I often will ask teenage patients who uh, are not interested in wearing a continuous glucose monitor for their daily self-management, if they'll consider just wearing it for the week before they come into a visit. Mm -hmm. And if I can prompt them to do that and they can tolerate that small dose of CGM, it really enriches the rest of our conversation during the visit, right? You probably find a lot of them after that week like, no, this wasn't so bad. It beats doing all the finger sticks. And Occasionally. Sticks. Sometimes it takes a few months uh, uh, to, to get them to come around. But yes, I, I think it's becoming more acceptable. And I think as the form factor for those devices improves and rolls with the barriers that young people experience related to self-image uh, and having devices on their body, we'll, we'll find that you know as, as we shrink the devices, they become more inconspicuous, we'll probably get even more buy-in. Um, so let me, uh, let me ask, 
the traditional model of in clinic brick and mortar care is a quarterly visit. And for the life of me, I don't know where a quarterly visit came from, except that uh, we have represented A1C since the beginning of time as a biomarker that tells us uh, how blood glucose control has been for approximately a quarter. And so somewhere along the way, we decided quarterly visits, maybe it felt you know, like a good trade-off between uh, burden and the need to really look and see uh, what's happening in the daily lives of individuals with diabetes. Um, how do you think this dependence on quarterly visits might be changing with the advent of uh, remote health care, telehealth, and uh, with the advent of the CPT codes for remote patient monitoring? I don't see it changing that much, unfortunately. And a lot of that has to do with the shortage of providers. Uh, I know in the case of endocrinologists, a lot of patients can, even can't get in every three months. It's mm -hmm. every four, five, six months. So you know, they're, they're pretty much stuck working with a primary care doctor um, who may not have a lot of expertise in diabetes care and management. There's a big difference though working with a certified diabetes care and education specialist who they can see more often. The digital tools that we have definitely help uh, improve the frequency of communication. And as I mentioned before, the, uh, yeah, the standard, the payer model that's used, the fee for service, it doesn't work in diabetes. 90% of diabetes care is teaching about lifestyle and motivating people and educating these individuals. And that's not the kind of thing you just do every third month. There's also a lot of data analysis that goes into it, especially for people who are on insulin. And that sort of thing needs to be done on a you know, frequent basis. In some cases, you know, we'll work with patients uh, every week until things are you know, pretty well established and then we'll space it out more. Uh, but uh, to me, the, the technologies that have been most useful are things like Zoom and even Skype and, and the other video programs that make it so easy for patients and, and their providers to get together. Now, we've been talking a little bit along the way about the burden we place on patients. It's, it's a burden to make them come to an office, to drive into the city or take mass transit and park and this and that, get childcare. For them to be able to receive quality care from home or from work, it alleviates a lot of the burden uh, of having diabetes and receiving that care. So I think it's it's highly beneficial. I agree 100%. I think what we've seen too is another benefit to having that telehealth, the remote option is it's a lot easier to bring in a caregiver or your support system. And a lot of time that's missing from in-person visits just because that individual can't take off work or they can't be there. And sometimes they're imperative to that day-to-day -day management of the diabetes. So I think that's been beneficial. Um, I agree with you. I think there, there are a lot of individuals that just so are not comfortable with the telehealth option. They, they think, well, I, I can't ask the same questions. You know, it's, it's not as personal. And I think once you can get them to try it and see that, Hey, we can make this more convenient, but it needs to be focused. And I think that ties back to getting the data to the provider. So if you're going to ask these patients to be on CGM or to have a device that's going to have valuable data, that's going to make these visits much more focused. Um, and you talk about time, you know, we, the clinics are spending more time just downloading the data than having a chance to review the data and make a more optimal treatment plan with the patient involved. So I think having as much as you can on the front end, it just, it just takes really walking them through one time. This is how you, you know, connect and get your data to us. And if you can do that ahead of your visits, oh, it's going to be, you know, so much easier for us to to have a really informed conversation and, and spend more time on maybe some of those educational um, topics that we need to be spending time on. So I think it's um, it's really an amazing thing, telehealth. And I, I think we're you know, gonna figure out what's that balance, um, but it ultimately has to be what, what's gonna work for the patient. So if it's like you said, if it's burdensome or if it's not deemed as beneficial or productive, not gonna go, they're not gonna take part. So I think we still have to work through this. Um, I love what you said, Teresa, what works for the patient, because ultimately 
the patients, the customer. And even though we're in healthcare, we think of ourselves as providers and them as patients, they're customers. And, and we, we're selling our wares to them, our expertise. Uh, and we have to think from that standpoint. We have to think like a marketing person would um, you know, in order to get that patient uh, to be at their appointments, to be engaged, to trust us, to follow through, we got to serve them. We got to be there where, where and when they need us. And it's a very important part of the marketing process. Yeah, so I so what I'm what I'm hearing in uh, responses so far really still leads me back to this notion of uh, uh, the need for the gift of time for the provider to prepare adequately. And Teresa, I, I heard very clearly your comment that you know there's um, there's really a screen or a filter that makes that can make video interactions just a little less personal unless we can figure out how to break down the barriers uh, that screens uh, create so i think that uh, we want our visits to be empathetically driven we want shared decision making we want persons with diabetes to be able to express their need clearly to us uh, and their questions clearly to us and uh in order to do that, we've got to figure out how to work with this new technology that can often feel, you know, clumsy and uh, and like an elephant in the room uh, uh, for uh, some period of time once it's introduced. So um, let me ask because I think that getting the device data um, to make it less burdensome to give us more time to focus on the person with diabetes, less time focused on questions like, you know, did you upload your data? Can I see the data? How can I help you make decisions? Um, what advice do you have for clinics, whether they're um, brick and mortar clinics or virtual clinics or virtual first clinics with limited resources? Um, how, how do you help patients to share their device data remotely? Uh, how do we get past that uh, elephant in the room, so to speak, so that we can move on to the actual conversation that drives caring for the patient? Well, platforms like Gluco, for example, they, they have all kinds of, of resources. There's documentation you can share with patients, simple step-by-step -step procedures. And Teresa, I think you, you said it's a worthwhile investment. Just spend 10 minutes or so get the patient, uh, get their data synced up, show them how to do their upload. It, it pays off in huge dividends because you, you teach them once, you don't have to do it again. And from that point on, you'll be able to access uh, current data whenever you need to. But I, I turn to the companies, the platforms uh, that, we get, that we get the reporting through um, to provide those kind of instructional resources. And also you can, the patients can call them uh, their, their service lines and, and be guided through it as well. So it's not the kind of thing that falls on us as providers most of the time. We can use those resources uh, to help in that process. Yeah, that's a great, a great point. And, I, and we have done that before. And if you don't have the capacity to actually make a call to the patient ahead of time and, and walk them through it, you know, maybe you can email them or text them those step-by-step -step instructions, um, but something, but they need to under, also understand the value of that, the why. Am I just sending this so that they can babysit me or they can see that I'm doing it? Okay, I'm doing it, I'm wearing my CGM, you know, whatever, but the why, you know, why Why is that? It's really, it's really gonna benefit them in the long run and, and your provider is so much more informed and you can tell them the changes you're making. You know, hey, you can see this on my on my data, but I recently really made a big change in the way that I'm handling my my dinner time, you know, or what I'm having for dinner or whatever. I started exercising, so it really opens up the conversation. But I think getting that to them, because too often patients say, "Well, they just do it for me when I go," and don't realize that's taking away <laughs> from the conversation that you could be having on other things that are important to you. Um, and getting them to understand that you can do this, you can do this, it's easy. Let's just walk through it once and, and you can do it. And I think glucose support has been, I know from our patients has been great. Like you said, call for support. Sometimes that's intimidating to a patient. 
So giving them the, you know, encouraging them to do so, just call, call the support and they'll walk you through it and then you'll be good going forward and it'll be so much easier. So sometimes it's just encouragement to, to give it a try. Yeah. And sometimes you can even teach the patient to look at their data or they yep. can get push notifications from that program that'll show you some of the summary stats, which I find very motivating for many mm -hmm. patients. Uh, you know, like the Dexcom's Clarity program, you can generate push notifications and every week see how much time you're in range. The meter companies often will do that. Their, their software, their apps can do that as well, could generate data for the user to see how they're doing. And if there's any issues that need to be addressed, they can uh, realize it even before the appointment. Right. Speaking of push notifications, I'll just mention briefly that, uh, again, in my own practice, we've taken, since the pandemic started, to uh, sending a pre-visit planning SMS message that reminds individuals of our education on how to upload their devices in preparation mm -hmm. for a visit. And you know, we, we don't customize it incredibly. We just send them the entire kit, if you will. And at the top, they can select which devices they have, and then they get uh, links to the education on how to upload that specific device. It's just a small thing that we do to try to reduce the burden uh, on them. So let me shift gears just a little bit here, because one of the things I've noted as a provider is that there are a lot of wellness programs out there that are competing for the attention of patients. Some of them are coming through payer organizations or employer uh, wellness programs. And when a person with diabetes has a medical home in your clinic, they may encounter advertising or invitations to alternate wellness programs, whether that's a new, you know, uh, a diet program, uh, a new exercise re regime, or a whole new coaching or check-in program. What's your advice to patients about how to evaluate these programs as they're starting to uh, get notifications more and more frequently, again, while, they're, while they've got a medical home with you? I refer them to experts. <laughs> Those apps, uh, many of them aren't worth the uh, software code they're written with. And some of them can be a little bit dangerous. Um, I, I prefer to have the patient discuss it with someone who knows about them. Uh, at, at registered dietitians, particularly those that are also certified diabetes care and education specialists, they, they know which are the better apps, which ones are reliable. Uh, I'd rather have them talk to an expert and figure out if, if what they're looking at is safe or not, and maybe direct them to something that is. There's also, there's a website uh, called uh, Dana.org that was put together by the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists. And there's a whole section within that that goes into detail about many of the apps that are out there. Some of them are lifestyle related, some of them are glucose management related, some of them are educational, some are therapeutic. Uh, but that, that website uh, in Dana.org, it's got a lot, it does reviews and rankings for a lot of those different apps that are available. Teresa, I don't know if you've ever used the, the Dana site yourself. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's definitely um, very informative. And I, and exactly what you said, it's, it's really developed by experts, you know, people who understand what individuals are looking for and what they need as well as um, uh, clinicians. But I think one of the things that we ask people up front is, okay, what are you looking to achieve by doing this? Well, I'm going to lose weight, or it's finally going to get my blood sugars down, or I can take less medication, or you know, whatever that may be. You got to kind of understand, okay, why? Why do you want to do this? All right, what have you tried already, and why didn't that work well for you? All right, let's look at this, and you hit it spot on, Gary. Is you know, how does this jive with your treatment plan or what you're doing right now? Do we need to be concerned with having low blood sugars by doing this? You know, you are really cutting out your carbs and you're on insulin. We really need to talk about this first before you consider it. So I think if you if you come right forward and poop it, you know, and say you have this negative, they'll, you know, you lose them. So maybe just kind of 
gearing it more towards, again, what's best for them. And, and these are the things, you know, I'm not saying no, but these are the things that you really need to be thinking about that you may not have thought about yet. And then ultimately let your provider know that you're doing this. Um, and sometimes we have to be careful because unfortunately some of these recommendations come from their provider. And without education, like you said, that can be dangerous in the sense that, okay, that's all right. You know, we can try this, but you really need to understand you're also going to have to do some, maybe some extra monitoring when you first get started on this, or you might need to tweak some of the times that you're eating or whatever. So um, I think it's just, a, and like you said, if there's an expertise that they can tap into instead or run it by, absolutely. Um, that's going to be most important, but um, just kind of you know, seeing what, what they're trying to achieve and see if you can suggest alternatives. Got it. How, um, so when we consider a program, whether it's a general diabetes education program or a specific program with a defined timeline, a beginning and an end, or a, a, a coaching program that may happen virtual, you know, in a virtual first model, how do you deal with issues of patient retention and um, you know, helping the individual to stick with the program uh, throughout? Again, you know, patients may have changes in their lives, they may um, change clinics, or they may change from one education program to another. But what I'm talking about more is, is how do you get them to uh, commit to and stick to a program for the duration? Uh, any strategies that you use for that to try to keep people engaged? Yeah, think like a marketer would. You, you want to keep them coming back. And that means they need to be engaged. They need new challenges. Uh, they need fresh topics. But like Teresa said, it's got to be focused on them as an individual. And that's something a lot of apps don't do is provide that kind of individualization you can only get that from a person and from a, a, a provider or a group of providers. I think those are really keys to quality retention is serving your, your patients' needs, meeting those customer needs. Yeah, 100%. I, I think we see that, you know, we offer a multitude of different programs lengthwise, three months, six months, 12 months. And I think um, the only someone's going to stay engaged is one if they continue to really view it as personalized it's about me not your agenda and what you think I need to be doing but what I currently am struggling with and what I want to learn you know I've always wanted to know how to do x and nobody's ever taken the time so I think when you put them on the forefront and kind of have them map out the program and then you can weave in those things you know that you want to make sure you do hit on um, and the data again if you have data available showing that to them and being able to have them apply that to their life is key. Um, flexibility, it needs to be flexible. If they can't meet for a couple months, even though they're supposed to, that's okay. You know, life is busy, but let's, let's do it when it's convenient for you. Evenings, if you can, lunch hour, you know, whatever is really gonna work for them. Because if I say it's on my schedule, I'll, I'll lose them. So it needs to be convenient for them. Yeah. Agendas um, well. are dangerous things. I agree. They are. <laughs> <laughs> Agenda the things you implement when you've got enough, you know, extra time. It's not yep. the focus. The focus is what's what are you interested in now? Yeah. Got it. So one of the themes that's emerging for me in this conversation is that um, you know, we really want not to deliver one size fits all care. We really want to personalize it to the needs of the individual. And to that end, we've seen two topics really emerge in the research literature as hot topics recently. Uh, those are um, uh, health equity, um, you know, uh, health equity related to socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, et cetera, and uh, social determinants of health, or, or what I really think of as social barriers to health. When we think about, um, coaching programs, uh, diabetes education programs, uh, you know, medical care programs and the like, how do we um, think about initiating screening programs for social barriers to health? And how do we think about adjusting our care to achieve better health equity? 
um, and, and, I, and I'm going to make an underlying assumption that that means we have to um, stop the one size fits all model. Um, if you look through that lens, how, how do you see us trying to differentiate things to achieve health equity and overcome those barriers to health? I know that in, in our field, uh, Teresa and mine, in, in diabetes care and education, there's so much emphasis now on cultural sensitivities. And you know, I, I've been doing this for decades. And 20 years ago, I don't think there was a single topic on that at the annual conferences. Now, every meeting, it's cultural sensitivity is, is a very important concept. So it's getting greater attention. That certainly helps. I find that taking the care to the people is one of the greatest things that's been happening recently. You know, from you know, having, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, not emergency care, but uh, urgent care, services available within communities and pharmacies that are providing care, that are providing diabetes education, consultation with the pharmacists. Those are really valuable tools. And then you have to consider programs like Cecilia Health, like Livongo, like My Sugar. You know, th these are easily accessible. You, you have a coach at your disposal simply because you use their glucose meter and the data is being uploaded to their servers. So it, 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 it's bringing care and service to the people rather than having to go out and get it. And that to me makes a big difference in being able to provide a more even playing field for everybody. Got it. Yeah, that's great, Gary. I, I think you're right. Being able to offer more opportunities for support around all of these touch points that somebody might encounter, like you said, the pharmacy and all these places. Um, I think, you know, SDOH is kind of a buzzword right now. And and as a clinician, we often find sometimes we're scared to even ask those questions because, okay, if they say yes, what do I do? You know, and, and we've incorporated that into our, into our programs because you have to. I mean, again, it's when we ask what's most important to that patient, it might come back as, well, where am I going to get food for my kids tonight? You know, mm -hmm. I don't eat unless they eat and that affects my blood sugars. So I think if you don't have a resource and can't address that, are you ever gonna to get to diabetes management? No, you're not. So I think if you're going to address those issues, which you need to be, because that's that can prevent their, their management, their care, you have to also have a solution to give them or a resource. So too often we ask those questions and we don't have a, you know, some help to provide them or some resources. So being able to come together more with uh, what resources are available, where can we route them? And then following up with that, you know, did was that helpful for you? Findhelp.org. I mean, there's a lot of entities out there that we can tap into that are going to be beneficial for someone. And, you know, that's trust. They, they then know that you care about them personally, and they're then going to move on to giving you more, a greater engagement and open conversation. So I think um, exactly what Gary said around just more access and more opportunities. And then, you know, we, we, we have to start addressing these, some of these other issues more consistently. Perfect, yeah, no, I, I, I love what you both said. It strikes me that we're, we're really getting to a place where we need to be thinking about population health, right? Not just, can I screen this patient in front of me right now for social barriers to health, but can I have a little eye in the sky across my clinic to let me see you know, who has those needs? Uh, and, and, and can I start to figure out how to mobilize resources because we have limited time, right? We have limited staff, limited time with which to accomplish everything we need to accomplish. How, how do I basically de-implement processes in a clinical care environment that aren't giving me uh, most bang, if you will? Um, they're, they're not helping me get those quality outcomes. And how do I use that time that I've captured back to implement processes that will move the needle? And I, I think one of those, you know, frankly, for clinics is how do I just start to screen for social determinants of health? I think we all think that it's important, but as Teresa said, it's difficult to ask the question if you don't know what you're going to do. Uh, and I do think some tools like findhelp.org that are out there do make it easier uh, to, to contemplate how to do that. 
Okay, so I want to I want to turn our attention in the next few minutes mm -hmm. to um, if you could wave a magic wand and you could um, transform the way we deliver diabetes care today. And let's make a few assumptions under it. Um, one is that uh, we have a healthy skepticism of apps uh, that are designed uh, to help people, but we think that you know some of them could be good extenders for the care that we provide. Uh, we assume that that personal touch, that one-on-one -on -one care is extremely important to the success of the individual. Um, what future developments excite you the most or, or, or do you think will be the most impactful and that we should consider doubling down on as a field? One area I think is it's pretty important is provider expertise. Uh, there's a new organization that's in that's developed and growing called the American College of Diabetology. This is to help uh, primary care providers, CD, CESs, people who aren't you know, endos now, develop expertise in diabetes so that they can provide better care. I think that's a very important thing because if you have providers who are not properly managing, coaching, teaching patients, it's, it's a real uphill battle. Hmm. Uh, from a treatment standpoint, I'm, I'm pretty excited about some of the new medications that help combat not just hyperglycemia, but obesity. You know, some of the newer classes of drugs, the GLP-1s, the SGLT-2s, but now we have a you know, new class, the GLP, GIP class of medications that seems to have profound effects on weight. That, that's that's a big deal. We can't think of diabetes in a vacuum, particularly type two, because it's compounded by a lot of other health issues that are you know, related to obesity. And uh, I, I would I'm very excited also about the tech in in the type one space and really intensive insulin use space. The, the technology now that can to a certain extent automate insulin delivery and keep patients glucose is within a healthy range, much more than they can do on their own. Anything that means less work and better results, that's a win. I like that. And that that's what these systems do. These, all, these hybrid closed loop type systems, uh, I think uh, have a lot of promise. I'm very excited about where that's headed. That's great. Excellent. Thank you, Gary. Um, I'm gonna kind of weave one of the questions that was posted into my answer a little bit. So I think, provider education as well as kind of making it easier for providers to refer patients for support. So I, th I think it seems so cumbersome and, and costly. You know, we need to make it very easy for them to say, you know what, I'm not going to deny you this opportunity just because I don't have the staff or the knowledge to support you. I could refer you over here and you could be onboarded or trained on this device and, and have it work for you. So I don't, I, you know, I don't want to deny access to anybody. I think there's ways we can all work together to provide that and in a cost-effective way. Um, but again, this whole digital solution, um, the comment, not everybody's going to have a smartphone or access to technology. Um, I think technology is going to allow us to scale and reach more individuals, absolutely. Um, but it's not realistic for everybody. And we find that a lot um, across the individuals we connect with. And it's an automatic barrier, you know, to diabetes management sometimes. So I think you have to get creative in, um, you know, if you can just check your blood sugars with a meter and have somebody take a picture for you. And maybe you can go to the library and email that to your provider or to me. I mean, you, you know, you kind of got to get creative that there's still ways that we can share data it might not be through these apps and, you know, these, these ways that make it so easy supposedly, but if you don't have access, but um, I think those community resources that are out there, such as the senior center and the library and schools, you know, schools will allow people to come in and, and access the internet or do things. And um, we've, we've had patients go to a McDonald's parking lot and tap into the Wi-Fi there in order to send some of their data or to send their picture of their blood sugar. So I think you know, you have to get, it's personalized. You have to get creative. You have to find out what patients are comfortable doing and what they have access to and try to get creative with solutions. But I think, you know, if, if we assume that everybody is going to be able to do these, these digital 
solutions and they'll be able to um, connect, you know, via telehealth across the board. I mean, it's just, it's not going to be realistic. So we have to continue to provide opportunities where um, we can be flexible and provide um, options that are going to work for different individuals. I'm just impressed you found a, a healthy, healthy application for McDonald's. That's great to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Through that. Um, I, 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 Teresa, I, I really like what you said about you know, the need for us to not leave individuals who have barriers to technology behind, right? Some people don't have smartphones. They may not have that internet access and may have to rely on internet access in public places. Um, they may not even have adequate cell phone service. Uh, I recall you know, seeing a family in the past who had to go to a neighbor's house to make phone calls to us. And you know, I, I think we sometimes look at the shiny new thing and say, oh, well, that has to become the standard way that we do business. But you know, the telephone is an invention that's had some real staying power. And one of the things that I think we can do is um, you know, something on our end, if we're receiving a call or we're proactively making a call to, to a family, uh, we could actually create standard work for how we collect that information verbally uh, so that the cognitive burden, you know, doesn't shift and change every time another person in the practice is collecting it. So I think you have to get creative. I mean, it's a, it feels a little bit like roughing it these days, but it's not roughing it for you know, the uh, millions of uh, uh, underserved and under-resourced individuals out there with diabetes in the U.S. or for those globally. I mean, just think about the state of diabetes care on a global basis, and uh, you'll see that, uh, you know, we can't all rely on smartphones and AI. Uh, it, 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 there's a long way to go to bring everybody forward. Yeah, we've had to do that. So, Mark, uh, you know, if somebody doesn't have data for us and we're just talking with them on the phone, you know, we have it. We'll ask them how many. So, how many times in the last week did you wake up with a glucose level over 200? Or how many times before lunch have you been low or been below 70? And you're having a systematic way of doing that. You can accomplish a lot. That's right. Yeah, to totally agree. Well, this is a, this is exciting discussion. You know, I really want to thank you both for your time. I want to thank those who came to join us today. Uh, I think there's a lot to noodle on here. If I were to summarize, you know, what I heard today, there are just a few themes that emerged to me. Right, one is that we have to figure out how to design in this new era with more remote care, acknowledging that we're trying to fit you know, a, a square peg into a round hole, right? That the payer systems aren't all set up to match that. Um, we need to advocate for innovation in uh, the payer system to help move it along to meet us where we are today. I, I think we all have a belief about what needs to happen uh, and we need the payer systems to match that. The other thing I think that emerges for me as a theme is uh, that what we're really trying to achieve, what is the foundational currency for quality patient care is the gift of time. And there are many different little tasks around the care for a person with diabetes that eat away at the time that we have to look a person um, in the eye and provide that supportive empathetic care that we all wanna provide. So any strategies uh, we can engage in that will help us to um, reduce the time burden on preparing for a visit or delivering that visit uh, so that more of it can be conversational, I think is to our advantage. And then, you know, we're living in an environment where uh, we have a lot of new technologies emerging, both uh, physical devices, apps, um, AI, things like that. And we really need to be thoughtful about what is useful, what is safe and vetted for safety, and what is actually creating an extension of our care rather than a sort of interference um, in, in our person-to-person -person care. Um, so with that, you know, I, I'd like to thank you both for joining us today. I thought this was a really fantastic discussion. 
I think we accomplished a lot here and I really appreciate the audience members uh, for their questions. I do think it's critically important that we think about those who have barriers to technology and how we provide care for them. So um, I'd like to uh, close us off today with just a uh, reminder. So the reminder is that this is the second in a series of webinars for GLUCO. Uh, I hope that everybody uh, has enjoyed today's session or if you joined our first one that you've enjoyed the first two sessions of our new Frontiers and Connected Care uh, webinar series. I wanna give you a heads up that we'll be switching up the format for session three. It's going to be focused on remote patient monitoring. Uh, we'll be uh, discussing this topic in a virtual summit format with open dialogue across a few small groups. So if you're interested in participating in that, uh, please send a message in the chat now uh, because there won't be an open registration like there was for this session. It'll be a smaller invitation only event, uh, but we, we will um, reach out to you if you contact us in the chat. And if you're interested in participating, please send a note in uh, that message box or you can email marketing at gluco.com. All right, Michael, anything else to close us out today? No, I just really wanted to thank uh, again, uh, Gary and Teresa for your participation today and for uh, for joining in this discussion. And of course, to you, Mark, for, for moderating. Um, in the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to see if uh, potentially, um, you know, Gary or Teresa, if you have any closing thoughts for uh, for, for the audience. I feel like we covered a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I appreciate Glico um, yeah. putting putting these together because I think it's great that you have the opportunity to to um, kind of speak for the individual. <laughs> I think sometimes we don't, you know, they don't have any anyone out there that's really advocating for what's most important for for those dealing with the chronic disease day in and day out. And so I really appreciate you um, providing these platforms and and appreciate the opportunity to take part. Thank Platforms you. like Gluco do give me the gift of time, time over mm -hmm. and over again throughout the day. I really do. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That's the objective. So, uh, well, I, I personally just want to thank you both. Uh, it's wonderful to have uh, thought leaders like yourselves here to speak uh, to us in this broader audience. So thank you.